Welcome to On the Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. I'm Brian Cantrell. With me, as always, is Jess Frizzell. Hey, Jess. Hey, Brian. And joining us is our boss, Steve Tuck. Hey, Steve. Glad to be here. Jess, you want to introduce who we've got in the the virtual garage today? Yeah, so today we have Trammell Hudson. He is remotely in Amsterdam, but I discovered Trammell, I guess, through the internet. He does crazy cool things with computers. It always seems like he's on a train or a boat or something, hacking on something. So yeah, very excited. Trammo, welcome to the Virtual Oxide Garage. I'm glad to be there. I think it's uh, wonderful that uh, you all have started a Silicon Valley company in a literal garage. In a literal <laughs> garage, I know. When, when Jess said her garage was perfect for us to get started in, we were like, that seems, seems a little too cliche, but it's a great garage actually, so... It's great to have you here. So Tramway, I have a little bit of a confession. I was attending a conference recently and they were asking me, uh, what website do you read that other people are not going to be aware of? And you're like, oh boy, all right, I got to like find something really interesting now. And I was thinking that, you know, what, what website do I go to that other people should be aware of, but maybe aren't? And I'm like, you know, I'm going to give them trmm.net. <laughs> Your website is delightful and there's so much interesting stuff there. So maybe you want to kick it off with, I mean, you've done so much of the hardware software interface. How did you first discover it when you were coming up? Well, so right out of school, I went to work for Sandia National Labs out in in Albuquerque on the high performance computing team. And uh, at the time, we were writing a custom operating system for these supercomputers. And so because performance was absolutely critical, we were running everything on the bare metal, and we really had to do a lot of work to make all of the compute resources available to the users. And as a result of spending so much time at the operating system and the message passing and the network driver sort of layer, I really came to love that, that sort of interface and you know, really realized how much capability came about just from uh, understanding how does the machine work and how can we best take use of it uh, from from software. And plus, I really like taking things apart, and it, it's fun to document what I what I learn uh, when I'm doing that. And that's really what my website is full of is just random. Essentially, it's my my project notebook uh, over the past. I guess I've been running it for about ten years now. And the big issue is my my attention span is pretty short. So a lot of these projects I'll work on for two, three, maybe six weeks, document them, and then move on to the next shiny thing. So there's there's a lot of unfinished stuff there, but also hopefully a lot of things that people might find useful. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff there that, that's useful and interesting. First of all, on that supercomputer at Sandia, what, what kind of machine was that that you were first exploring? So the very first one that I worked on was a... Uh, Intel Paragon. It <laughs> was an IE60 based machine, yeah, right? And it was the world's fastest uh, supercomputer. We were uh, number one on the top 500 for many, many years. And the, uh, the sort of fun story with that one is it shipped with a, a single system image Unix called OSF1. Well, you actually ran OSF1. Well, so we tried to. The <laughs> problem is that OSF1 consumed about 12 megabytes of memory out of the 16 megabytes that we had per node. <laughs> Remember, this is the, you know, the 1990s, so that was still a lot of memory. And that didn't make uh, our users very happy to have this massive machine and so much of the resources going to the OS. So what the group that I worked in did was we built our own lightweight kernel that nice. only used a couple hundred kilobytes. And okay, uh, that ended wow. up becoming the official OS for the uh, for the Paragon. So an all I-860 based. So the an I-860 RISC microprocessor, right? If, if memory serves. Yes, and you know, RISC is going to change everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. And I-960 was the follow-on. Did they end up, did you end up running that as well? Or that, by that point, had they moved on to other CPUs? So from at that point, we had moved on to another CPU. Uh, the next machine we built after that was ASCII Red, 
excuse me, uh, ASCII Red Storm. No, no, sorry. ASCII Red was the next one. And that was uh, Pinium Pro based. Some and way, so we, we had yeah. the, uh, the Pinium Pro was a really weird design with like a multi die package, incredibly low yields. And Intel gave us a, a special spin of it to, I think, with the Xeon core in, in the same package, which was super buggy. And my uh, attempts to get some, uh, some patches into the Linux kernel were rejected since there were only a, a few thousand of those, I think 50,000 of those CPUs in the world, and we had all of them. So <laughs> Hard for others to test. Yeah, so, so uh, Linus did not accept my patches. That, that seems to be a common theme. Especially when you're sitting on all of a particular <laughs> breed of microprocessor that it sounds like a very strange hybrid. It, it was a really weird sort of design. And then the follow-on from that was the uh, ASCII Red Storm, and that was Opteron-based. One of the things I really enjoyed about working on the Paragon was how tightly the network was coupled to the CPU, that we could, we, we could use the DMA engines for doing like a MIM copy and it was faster to, to ask it to DMA 128 bytes than it would be to do a byte-by-byte -byte copy from the CPU. And when you compare that to going out to a PCIe where you have you know, 500 to 1,000 nanoseconds just to you know, do a round trip out to that bus, you know, being able to do something so quickly to the, uh, the NIC was really quite fun to, to play with. Well, and especially when you have so many cores presumably harnessed together in a network, I imagine that was essential to be able to have that, that kind of networking performance. Yeah, and at that point, because of the, the relatively small memory, communication was much, much more important for the, uh, the HPC machines of that era. And this is, is this 10 megabit maybe? I'm trying to think what would be the, the interface speed at that time. Uh, well, we, we spent a lot of money on, on the NIC. Uh, with these machines, you'd usually estimate that a third of your money was just going to the network. So it's been a long time, but dredging back for, into those neurons, I think we I think we were doing 400, and then wow. we were able to push that to 800. 800 um, megabit in the mid-90s or late 90s. It that's really like. good. That, that was in the, yeah, the, the like 94, 95 when 16 megs is the amount of DRAM you've got to be able to push 800 megs, yeah, that's, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun machine. The, the other thing, though, that it really colored my view on how to, uh, how to design large-scale systems, that we, we, we partitioned these machines so that we would have some number of nodes that would, uh, were connected to the outside world, and we ran an interactive OS on them. We had some number of nodes that were connected to disks, and we ran a file servers on those. And then most of the nodes in the middle had no external network connection and no disk connection. They were just pure compute. And this meant that we could, with a fairly small staff, you know, we, we could maintain effectively tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of systems you know, where you might expect a Unix system admin not to scale to quite that sort of scale. But you're doing it where there was no state on uh, most of the nodes, where there was no, there were no moving parts on most of them. They would all boot off the network. They all would reconfigure on the fly. This was a really elegant way to manage and administer hundreds of thousands of cores. Yeah, I mean, this has been very futuristic in the the mid to late '90s to have that kind of quantity of uh, certainly that many CPUs and and the managing them in that manner is you must have wondered how anyone else was doing it it seems like such an elegant way to do it yeah when when most folks you know tap out around you know a few dozen computers uh, per admin it, it was really quite something to be able to say oh you know we we measure our computers not in core count but in in uh, acres <laughs> that's awesome and so, w was that your first exposure to, to to firmware? When did you begin to discover all of the software that was beneath the software? That was really where I started spending most of my time, sort of in the firmware world. With the, I think with ASCII uh, Red Storm, we had a coprocessor in the NIC that we were able to write code for. So my group developed uh, something called Portals that ran underneath uh, MPI, the message passing interface that all of the, uh, the big Fortran codes use. 
And so we, we wrote code that ran in the NIC to do all of the OS bypass and message matching offload. And that, that really you know, was the eye-opener that, oh, everything in the system is, a, is just another computer, and we can program it, and we can make it do what we want. Yeah, that must have been a real aha moment to realize how much software was beneath the software that you thought was the lowest level software in the system. <laughs> yeah, ring zero in the in the uh, CPU or the in the OS is you know, not the uh, not the bottom of the stack by far. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know where the bottom of the stack is anymore. I feel like I feel like every time I feel I found the bottom, there's some hidden ring. I mean, Jess, you got a great article going into what you got to ring negative three, I think. Yeah, I mean, it depends who you ask, though, because a lot of people are like, eh, those are just made up rings, because once you've reached, like, the the lower levels, it's all just like, eh. How low does it go? Is negative three the bottom? I mean, again, it kind of depends on who you ask, the, the, but what you've got is th- this firmware that's at a very low level of the system that can control the entire system. And so it's it's hard to argue that that software isn't beneath the software that thought it was controlling the whole system. Yeah, Jess's article really did a, a wonderful job of laying out a lot of the sort of hidden pieces in, inside the uh, commodity machine you know, between the uh, SMM and the management engine. Once you get even further down where you're dealing with the, uh, the BMC or the embedded controllers, there's just a lot of unexamined code that has way too much privilege. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's a big concern for not just runtime security, but also for things like resale and decommissioning, you know, how do you know that the systems that you're turning over don't have any state still on them? And more importantly, how do you know the systems that you're buying haven't been compromised somewhere in the supply chain in you know, one of these, uh, these tiny microcontrollers sitting on an important bus somewhere? That's a good segue into your talk at, what was it, 34C? I always forget the numbers. The mod, um, mod chips of yeah, the state. Yeah, mod chips of the state, the notorious talk where you basically prove that like what happened in the Bloomberg article is entirely possible, although it's skeptical as to whether like that happened in real life, but it, it's a great talk. It, no, that was a terrific talk. And for folks who have not seen that, and they definitely should, we'll link to it in the show notes, but describe a bit what you're able to show there, Trammell. So the, the part that uh, really struck me in the in the Bloomberg article was uh, some of the detailed descriptions of how a, a hardware implant on, on the spy bus between the uh, a flash chip and the BMC could take control and potentially wreak havoc. And I think a lot of those details came from Fitz, who was one of the consultants on the article. So I set out to see, well, what could... Could we actually replace a a signal conditioning coupler, in this case, a a small resistor on the board, with an active component that could inject its own payload into the BMC while it booted? Figuring out how to do that without power, without clock, without a lot of the the niceties of the the spy bus was a a really fun challenge. Um, It was also my first intro into FPGAs, and I've really come around to realize that they are, you know, a wonderful tool for for doing a lot of these very timing critical sort of hardware interface things. So many of the projects I had done with with Arduinos, I've gone back to and realized, ah, it would have been easier to do this with the FPGA. Wow, not not something you necessarily think of that like an Arduino project would have been easier with an FPGA. <laughs> Anything that's really timing critical, and the spy bus, which is where the the, the firmware that the BMC or the x86 lives, you know, is a really timing critical bus. It's you need to be able to deliver bytes in response to commands in a single digit uh, nanoseconds. So it's it's the sort of thing where you really need that programmable hardware to make it happen. It was operating what at twenty megahertz, a little faster. What, what's the, what's the speed of that that bus operates? Uh, so the, when when the x86 boots up, it starts it at uh, 16 megahertz, and then we'll ramp it up to see if it if the chip says it can handle it. Uh, though I've just recently ported some of these things over to uh, one of the newer A speed BMCs, and they do interesting thing where they they will read a section of the flash and um, check some it, and then they will just increase the the clock speed rereading that section until they get a bad checksum. <laughs> And then they'll back their speed down a little bit, and that's the speed they'll use. Wow, I, 
that's uh, so they actually just push it to the breaking point and then conclude that that's the fastest that they can operate. And and how fast can that stuff operate? How fast is the spy flash? Are they able to push it? Usually, uh, fifty to eighty megahertz okay. yeah. is a, a reasonable speed if you have very short connections and not a lot of uh, loading on the uh, capacitive loading on the bus. One of the projects that I've turned the mod chips talk into is something called the Spy Spy, which is now a, a general purpose flash emulator that is really a lot of fun to poke at systems when they're booting because you, you can learn a lot of, both about the security of the system as well as a lot of the various other components. So with, with the Spy Spy, we can, we can monitor the data that's going across that spy bus and we can also uh, modify it or swap it out with our own content. Spy Spy is amazing. And I, I actually, I have to tell you that I uh, went to see what the Hacker News discussion of Spy Spy was when it came out and was dismayed to find that it had never been submitted to Hacker News. So I think months after you'd released it, I'm like, well, I'm going to obviously submit this to Hacker News. I feel that Hacker News revealed that it is not, in fact, Hacker News when the fact the fact that Spy Spy was not there was should have been a total indictment on on the yellow website, the orange website, because it's a it is a really terrific piece of work. It's very interesting and allows you to get this total view into this unseen part of the system. And I, I really like that aspect of it, that it's the sort of microscope of what's happening during the first few microseconds when when your system turns on. A lot of the security research that I've done is focused on that early boot time. And it's you know it's a, a fairly short window, but if malware or an attacker is able to take control during that time, they can really do a lot of nefarious things and getting into very those uh, negative rings that uh, that Jess mentioned is a definite possibility. Getting into other hardware that perhaps trusts the firmware during the startup phase is a possibility. There's just a lot of really difficult problems for how do we secure systems against an attacker who can uh, modify the data on that bus that early. And it's, it, maybe it's worth explaining to folks why that bus is so critical, because effectively that is where the system is bootstrapping itself from, right? That, that's where effectively the first instruction that the x86 is going to execute comes from. That, that's where the first instruction that the BMC tends to run comes from there. The management engine has a onboard ROM, so it is actually able to do some validation of it before it starts, which is a, a nice thing for security, but also a somewhat frustrating thing f in terms of user freedom. That it means that it's not possible to swap out that code the way uh, Core Boot or Linux Boot wants to be able to do, or Open BMC or Micro BMC on, on uh, the BMC side of things. So th there's definitely a trade-off between. How do we secure the systems against an attacker who can modify the flash versus how do we allow the computer owner to modify the flash to install their own uh, firmware of their own design? Well, this is a really important tension, right? In terms of like, whose computer is it? And if, it's, if I bought it and it's my computer, I should be able to load kind of arbitrary things on it. But if I can load arbitrary things on it, then arbitrary malware can do arbitrarily bad things to me, right? How do we resolve this tension? This is where a lot of uh, my current research is going into with uh, attestation, that if we can have the systems prove to an outside observer what they ran during startup, then perhaps we don't care so much about who put it there, as long as we can say this is the code that we expected to be there. And I, I think that's, a, that's an elegant way to get around a, a lot of that tension where a company like Apple has done some amazing work at building secure by default systems, they unfortunately have done that at the expense of user freedom. Things like Chromebooks, I think, are doing a much nicer job, where you can swap out the firmware in the Chromebook, but if you go to log into Google with modified firmware, Google's able to know that, and it's able to then prompt you on a different device to say, hey, the Chromebook that you're trying to log in on is potentially compromised. Do you still want to do it? And that that attestation, I think, is uh, really uh, liberating because it allows the computer owner to swap everything out and still be able to tell exactly what was running, even though it's not signed by Google, so that they can sign it uh, for themselves. 
Yeah, I love the design of the Chromebook. I remember when it came out. And also the fact that like Chrome OS is entirely open source, so you can actually just go and fork it, which is something that like, Core OS ended up doing. And then when I decided to make a bespoke operating system, I did as well. But but the design of the Chromebook, I think, was really like revolutionary when it came to open source security because it's something that Apple had closed off for such a long time. And the Chromebooks, I think, are one of the only uh, widespread uses of attestation in the uh, non-mobile space that you know, computers have been shipping with TPMs for well over a decade now, and most of them go unused. You know, the Linux community has never really embraced them, and Windows really only uses it for BitLocker, and then only if you have a version that, uh, that has that support. So it was really wonderful to see Chromebooks requiring TPMs and actually using them and actually using them for this uh, this attestation to be able to say, this is the firmware that is running on the machine. Can I ask what a TPM is? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the TPM is a trusted platform module, and it's a small security coprocessor that can hold secrets and it can it can measure the the code that's running on on the main CPU. Well, there's a hand wavy bit there. It, it actually can't measure directly, but it can be asked to measure things. And then it can do a cryptographic signature to prove that a real TPM has measured those values, which then allows an outside observer to say, the firmware running on this machine matches the expected measurements, the, ex- the expected hashes, for the firmware that, that I installed, and the TPM attests that this is actually what's running there, and therefore, perhaps you can trust uh, this computer or this server or this uh, Chromebook. Thank you. And it sounds like a TPM is necessary, but not sufficient, as you were describing earlier. So the, the TPM definitely needs a fairly tight interaction with the early boot firmware to actually be able to, to get any of those security guarantees. But then if you don't have that, a malicious software could perhaps put fake measurements into the TPM and then get a quote uh, from it. So it's necessary that that every stage during the boot process has to be able to measure the next stage into the TPM before jumping into it. And this creates what's called the chain of trust. And the big problem right now is that most commodity firmware doesn't maintain that chain. So it's possible to get unmeasured code executing during the boot process at which point you're done. <laughs> yeah, the, the the security guarantees uh, completely evaporate. And Steve, just to make you feel better, I I was relatively certain that TPM stood for tamper proof module. I think I've probably thought that for years. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, great. thank you for asking the question. I like, okay, of course it stands for tamper proof. No, wait a minute. Oh, wait, a trusted platform module. I, 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 I was wrong. definitely expecting a oof. Uh yeah, sure we could explain that to you, well, Steve. And it, it is designed to be, I mean, part of the the reason I thought it stood for the wrong thing is these things are designed to be tamper proof. I mean, this, this actually is a, and there's important countermeasures that go into the designing these things such that if you try to actually physically tamper with one of these things, it won't actually operate. Yeah. I mean, actually one of the things that Trimble is most widely known for, or at least I think so, uh, the evil mate attack. And yeah, the, the, the tamper resistance of TPMs is typically not particularly strong that they, they may have some hardening features in the in the uh, chip design, but they, they are not tamper-proof by, by any means. <laughs> just, all right, the, the trainer was just twisting the knife a little yeah. bit. <laughs> like, like, a little I, I was like, let me just uh, jump in here to be like, I don't know how anybody could think of this as tamper-proof. Not uh-huh. even tamper I'm feeling resistant. better by the minute. No, you should feel, yeah, exactly. And so going back to what Jess mentioned about uh, evil main attacks, there are actually quite a few uh, physical attacks against the TPM chips that people have, have pulled off from. You know, some of them are more invasive that involve decapsulating them. There's the TPM Genie that is basically, it's like the Spy Spy, but it's for the LPC bus that the TPM's on, and it's able to subvert the, the measurement process. So even if you can't pull a, I think a Travis Armandi did a, did a full decap on a TPM, and that, that's pretty invasive. That's probably not a, a realistic threat model for most people. But someone being able to hook some probes up to the TPM on the main board during boot and bypass the measured trust is you know, a little more realistic. 
And are you saying evil maid attack? Is that, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah. Like an evil maid. Yeah, because like if you were to leave your computer in a hotel room, oh, basically. Oh, the evil maid. Oh. The evil maid the could evil attack maid. your computer. The diabolical state actor maid. Got it. Okay. That, that's Which the, is why when I travel, I use a Chromebook. All right mm. then. <laughs> Hopefully it's TPM has not been decapped. I guess it's got Titan, which is good. It's, it's got a pretty good reputation anyway. Yeah, the, the the Titan chip has taken over several different roles in the in the Chromebook. It, it's both acting as the TPM. It's also acting as the uh, the closed case debugger, which is a really handy feature. Um, if you look at, as you pointed out, a lot of my photos are pulling apart heart uh, computers while while traveling, um, <laughs> which. You know, occasionally gets uh, weird looks on the on the train or the plane when you're hooking uh, debugging probes up to um, bare circuit boards. With the newer Chromebooks with the Titan chip, you can actually do firmware updates and debugging through the Titan, which then shows up as a as a special device externally on, on the USB. That's uh, that's a great feature, actually. Do they document that? That, that sounds terrifically useful. Uh, there was a. There was a talk at OSFC 2018 about uh, how to use it. Oh, nice. nice. Some of this stuff is undocumented because I know at least like with my Chromebook on the side, the power button doubles as a security key. And so that was actually undocumented, but then people kept hacking it and adding it to two-factor auth mechanisms. And then they were like, okay, whatever, it's a thing. That is awesome. Hey, so we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with more Trammel Hudson. On the Metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company. Wait, did you say computer company, Jess? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> but wait a minute, everyone runs on the public cloud. Jeff Bezos uh, owns no. and operates every computer on the planet. Why would anyone start a computer company? That is so not true. I have spent a bunch of time talking to folks who are still running on premises. And actually, like the consensus among all of them is just a feeling of neglect because everyone thinks that like everything is moving to the public cloud, but it's not. If you're still running on premises, it's because you haven't heard of the cloud, right? No. There are really good reasons for running on premises still. For security, for latency, strategic reasons for your business. Wow, the people running on premises must feel like everyone has ignored them. They do, indeed. So if this is you, please head on over to our website, offside.computer, sign up for our mailing list, and we would love to get in touch and hear your stories. We acknowledge that you exist and you've got some really hard technical problems that we're solving. Oxide.computer, come join us. All right, we're back with Trammell Hudson. There's some terrific tales of the hardware software interface. So Trammell, you had mentioned the OSFC, the Open Source Firmware Conference. <laughs> Jess and I went to OSFC out here in Silicon Valley, whatever it was in, in the fall, it was terrific. Uh, do you want to speak a little bit about what you're seeing in the in the open source firmware movement? Yeah, it's a really wonderful uh, resurgence in interest in, in building uh, open firmware for these machines. A lot of it goes back to the, uh, the Linux BIOS project, which was started by Ron Minnick at uh, Los Alamos National Labs. They were one of our competitors in New Mexico. <laughs> and he had similar problems. When, when they moved to commodity hardware or commodity CPUs for their large-scale supercomputers, managing them with the BIOS was not really working well for them. That trying to uh, pixie boot tens of thousands of systems on a 100 megabit Ethernet just was not feasible. So Ron and uh, one of his some of his colleagues had the idea of let's just put Linux in the spy flash on these main boards, then be able to to k exec into a uh, an actual payload. So rather than being stuck with whatever closed source uh, pixie booting things that were shipped in their machines, they were able to take advantage of all the flexibility of Linux. That turned into a core boot. And then Google selected that for all of their Chromebooks. And unfortunately, there were really no servers that were available with Coreboot due to licensing issues and NDAs from, uh, from Intel for, for many years. Intel, just recently, we, we started a project called uh, Linux Boot, which took the idea that we could, we could use just the DRAM initialization part out of Intel's proprietary FSP, their firmware support package graph that onto Linux and be able to jump very quickly from, from the reset vector, initialize DRAM, and then let Linux do absolutely everything else. And this project's uh, 
attracted attention from a lot of the hyperscale folks. Ron is now at Google. There are folks at Facebook who are also contributing. And uh, we're working closely with the Open Compute Project to try to make open system firmware a requirement for their uh, open hardware branding. And it really is wonderful to have all of this flexibility. So rather than being stuck with you know, whatever limited shell UEFI provides, you, know, you get Bash or Go or Python or you know, whatever, whatever tools you want. I think uh, Ron had a wonderful quote when we were getting started about you know, Linux boot turns all of your uh, Linux engineers into firmware engineers. So it, it takes it from something where you had to have really specialized knowledge and writing real mode assembly and all this arcane stuff to suddenly it's, it's just Linux. And you know we all know how to use Linux. So suddenly we can do much, much more interesting things. It's a terrific development. I mean, here at Oxide, we are huge believers in the open source firmware movement. So it's great to see it have this kind of critical mass and good on you for getting the Open Compute Project on board as well in terms of getting them to any firmware, any hardware we're going to brand open should have open firmware. So it's great to see that movement really swelling. Yeah, I think it really should be a requirement that if you're going to be making anything called open, you know, it needs to be open at as many levels as, as possible, you know, from the schematics and the, the board design files, you know, to all of the uh, the pieces that are they're running inside of it. There have been a few projects to try to you know build like a completely open source system. Bunny made his Novena laptop that had every part had a non NDA data sheet. Unfortunately, in sort of the large scale server space, that's not really feasible right now. But perhaps with a uh, Risk Five, we'll start to see something there. Yeah, that would be nice down the road for sure. Hey, speaking of Risk Five, what do you think of the uh, of Open Titan? That's a very exciting announcement recently that we're certainly excited about. What's your take on Open Titan? So I'm I'm really encouraged that uh, Google is making the uh, the Titan chip more widely available. Um, hopefully, it's going to be one of those things that starts to become a standard feature on, on systems, you know, not just on Chromebooks and on uh, Google servers. And I think it's really vital that that anything that we we're putting that much trust in needs to be as open as possible. And they've, you know, it, it's, the, the source tree is astounding. You know, it has the full CPU. It's got uh, all of the software and firmware that runs on it. it. It's really, you know, an exceptional resource for learning how this sort of a complex security coprocessor is built. My one disappointment right now is that it uh, only builds for a closed source FPGA. I'm, Started looking to see if I could port it over to the Project Trellis and um, Next PNR for uh, open source uh, development, but thus far I've not yet been successful. Interesting. Yeah, that the actual tool chain itself is is proprietary. Right. That if you want to build for their test board, you need the vendor FPGA tools. It's like a fifty gig download, and it's like locked to your one machine, and it's just not a very developer friendly sort of environment. Compared to uh, the Yosis and NextPNR that are you know, very much coming out of the, uh, the open source movement. So all of the tools play well with make files. They play well with version control. It's, it's just an absolute delight to develop for compared to the vendor tools. So maybe on that note, I mean, for those folks who are interested in getting involved in, in FPGA exploration, what, what would you recommend? They, how do they start? How do they start messing around with FPGAs? There are some really low-cost FPGAs out there, low-cost open-source FPGAs. The ICE-40 comes in a lot of different variants. There's the uh, the Icebreaker is a really nice one with a very well-designed board with lots of I.O. I've been using the, the Updino V2, which is like a $9 board, and it's uh, it's serviceable for a lot of these things. And if folks want to do sort of larger projects, the ULX3S from uh, Radiana Hackerspace in Croatia is a really full-featured board. It has uh, HDMI and Wi-Fi and SD card, you know, lots of really useful features for, for building things. A lot of people are doing like cool retro projects where they're, they're emulating old consoles on it and then uh, using the HDMI port to, uh, to display the video. But at the low end, the ICE-40s are really capable. It's surprising how much you can fit in uh, in a few thousand gates. 
I love the retro stuff. I have to say, Jess, you've got what you got a PDP ten right in the in the other room. PDP eleven and PDP eight, PDP but eight they're the 11. replicas. They're the Pi DPs. I, it's so much fun to be replicating these old machines on on the much newer silicon. Trent, will you want to talk about some of the the retro computing projects you've done? Because you've done a bunch of them. So at, at my uh, previous employer, we had a, a small retro computing museum with some PDP 11s, some actual PDP 11s, which uh, unlike Jess's um, <laughs> small version, <laughs> consume a bit more power and a bit more floor space. But I, I saw when when you were soldering together the PDP and it looked very, very fun. So w- we actually found that one of the PDP 11s on Craigslist of all places. Oh, whoa, that would not be where I would think that Looked, you would find that. Oh, for a, you found a PDP-11 on Craigslist? That is amazing. We actually ended up with an entire late 70s, early 80s data center that <laughs> what? Uh, what? Mount Sinai had basically taken uh, this <laughs> massive amount of hardware and just put it in storage in uh, sometime in the, uh, the mid-80s. So it was local in New York if it was Mount Sinai, right? I mean, yeah. okay. Oh, that's nice. Uh, oh, you got to ask the question anytime you get to things on Craigslist, but especially PDP 11. Was it stolen? It had to be. This has to be a stolen <laughs> PDP 11. I think they had put it in storage. And then 25 years later, they said, why are we still paying for the storage fee? And so they, uh, it was a basically, you have to take it all. So we ended up with a couple of PDP 11s, a pallet of uh, terminals and dot matrix printers, and a, a lifetime supply of eight-inch uh, floppies. You know, it's it was really quite the haul. That is quite the haul. Was it listed that way on Craigslist, or was it just Must you know take, take whatever is in mystery locker old computer equipment? It, it was uh, uh, old computer equipment. Must take it all. But there was a photo, and mm. that made it very clear that it was a a, a PDP. So yes, we rented a panel truck and spent a, a weekend cleaning out this locker. And then we're able to uh, restore and get two of the PDP 11s boot in, quite a few of the VT 100s. And it also included quite a bit of uh, software and yeah, what, um, what, including what's the operating some system? source code. So we've put all that up on uh, archive.org. Oh, wow. And I have some documentation on my website about some of the paper tapes and things that, that we retrieved as well. That's great. That's cool. what, what was the operating system? Was it was it running Unix or this one was running RT eleven? Right, because it was being used in a data collection experiments. So they, they needed the uh, the real time OS, it, and that actually gave rise to one of the funniest finds. Was a, a nine track tape labeled "Digitized Monkey Brains." <laughs> what what was on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, yeah, right. <laughs> What's, that's the question. Well, we were, we were unable to read the tape. But, uh, um, wait, yeah. that story has no ending? That's the end of the story? <laughs> that's what really sad. <laughs> the digitized monkey brains, had that, that, that's it? We don't, we don't have them. We, we don't have the monkey brains. We, we, were, we were unable to get the tape drive uh, working, unfortunately. We did get the eight-inch floppy drive working, as well as the disk packs. The, uh, it's been a few years. I don't remember if that's the RLO1 or the RKO5. And on there were some... Actually, quite a bit of interesting things, um, including some email spools that uh, we did not upload to the archive. But one of them was a was a draft of a uh, speech that one of the doctors gave to a convention of doctors, talking about his department's decision to buy a computer, oh and my gosh. You know, they spent several hundred thousand dollars on it. And he, he warned the other doctors that uh, if they bought one. They might not do any more science or doctor work because it was so much fun to program that he found that he was spending all of his time, all of his free time now, writing uh, basic programs that would help with data analysis and processing things. Oh my gosh, that must have been mesmerizing to find. I mean, what what a tale from the crypt. Did you find the physician? I mean, did you locate any of these folks? found the, the physician's son and forwarded the contents over, over to him. The physician had passed away quite some years earlier. Wow. Well, speaking as the, the son of a physician who discovered that he was that he loved software, I'm, I'm sure that his, his son appreciated getting it. That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, it was really quite an interesting find. So the, the, the P2P11 is definitely a fun one. Uh, I also did a lot of fun work with teletypes 
one of which we hooked up to the PDP because that was uh, period appropriate, the ASR33. And that was the uh, the teletype that Unix was originally written on. Oh, wow. Not the specific one, but the, that, that model. And if you go to a, even a modern Linux system and look in a Etsy term cap, you'll find a term definition for the TTY33, which is you know the, this paper output, 110 baud, caps only teletype. And TTY comes from a teletype, right? I mean, isn't that where yeah. the, the, yeah, that's yeah, the origin of, I mean, we used to talk about TTYs all the time and that's without thinking of it as being a teletype. Yeah. So we had that one hooked up to the uh, to the PTP 11 and it was wow. quite fun, but we didn't want to run the PTP 11 all the time. So we moved it over to a emulated PTP 11, run it on Raspberry Pi. <laughs> but it, it definitely, using that for a little while reinforces or, or reminds you why all of the Unix commands are one or two characters and why the default behavior is not to output anything if everything worked fine. Because 110 baud is really slow. Really slow. That's really interesting, yeah. And you can type way faster than 110, except that the ASR33 is entirely mechanical. It has no electronics whatsoever. So there's no keyboard buffer that when you when you hit a key... It has to finish transmitting that key before you can hit another one. So there's a mechanical lockout that when you hit a key, none of the other ones will go down until the transmission is finished. Wow. And what's the distance from the teletype to the actual machine? I mean, how long does it take for it to propagate, have the signal be confirmed to get back? I mean, is that a, I guess you said 110 baud, so I guess that's what it is. Right, right. So this is not a not a latency of communication to the machine, but just in terms of clocking out the eight bits of, of data. And it's done via a mechanical rotor that spins around. So it's actually being driven by a uh, AC synchronous motor for timing. <laughs> and you know, it has to make after the gearbox, it has to make one revolution to transmit those eight bits. And so until that revolution finishes, you can't hit another key. Wow. I mean, this is like steam powered computing. This is, this is, you must feel like you're going back to the actual dawn of computing to have such a mechanical mechanism enforcing the, your baud rate effectively. Right, right. It, it's very steampunk. In fact, I, I made that observation that uh, real computers are ones that have uh, oil fill ports and uh, grease nipples for, in, <laughs> to ensure proper operation. I don't think I've ever worked on a real computer. I feel it. this makes me, uh, that, that's, that's absolutely amazing. So in, did this whole experience, I mean, the experience of resurrecting this incredibly old machine with so much functional software, and you think about like, you know, we obviously, we no longer have the, we no longer pour oil into our machines. And yet the software that was designed around those machines has persisted. I mean, it's just amazing how much longer the software survives than, than the hardware that contains it in many ways. There's a quote from one of the original Unix newsletters about that there are now 10 installations around the world and that number is expected to grow. And you know, I really wonder how many Unix machines are there now? We have them in every pocket. They're probably in a lot of light bulbs and doorknobs. You know, it really is a phenomenal how long-lived the, the kind of the Unix philosophy has been. When you think about how many, when you've got a single system, how many different Unix systems are on that single system where you've got, you've got, you know, the BMC, you've got all these other CPUs, microcontrollers and so on that are running their own variant inside of that larger supposedly single system. Right. We really need to think of our computers more as distributed systems that happen to be built onto the same board rather than single systems. Tremel, I was going to ask you, it seems like the sources of some of your interesting projects have been pretty creatively sourced. You found stuff on Craigslist, stuff in storage lockers. Before we started, you were talking about a project that stemmed from finding some, some equipment on the side of a road in Brooklyn. And it seems like that has been a good source for uh, some interesting projects like the Mac SE ROM that you wrote up on your page. Right. So the Literally found on the side of the road in uh, in Brooklyn, uh, you know, an old Mac SE with a with a bad hard disk, and that turned into a really fun project. One of the things I like to do when I encounter old machines is to uh, dump the ROMs, 
you know, as we talked about earlier in the program, there's so much interesting stuff that lives in in that firmware, and it, it's you know very instructive to to see what's there. With with a lot of the old ones, uh, you find really fun bitmap fonts or icons, or in the case of the Mac SE, uh, a really neat Easter egg of the team that worked on uh, producing the um, that machine. This is really cool. <laughs> And your your blog post goes into how exactly, I mean, that's what I love about your work is you don't just describe what you found, but how you found it. So someone could actually go replicate this and and learn about the, the, the whole tool chain that you're using to actually learn about this stuff. I think that's the really important part for documenting is to ensure that other people can can do it as well. You know, usually in all of uh, all of my conference talks, I don't want to just talk about, oh, here's a cool thing I did. I want to be able to help people do that and then go further. Most of the projects that I work on, as I mentioned, you know, I only spend a few weeks on it before finding something else. So getting into a state where someone else can pick it up and 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 go forward, you know, makes me happy. Um, most of my really successful projects, I've really only gotten off the ground and then handed the commit keys over to to the community. You know, there's the joke about, you know, the two happiest days are when you start a new Git repo, and then the second happiest day is when you hand the keys off to another developer. Yeah, that's right. pretty much how I uh, treat most of these projects. And trying to document it both so that I can remember what I did, if I ever go back to it, as well as, you know, so that the uh, the next maintainer can continue to work on it, I think are really key things. Yeah, I think that's one of the greatest powers of open source is uh, building on top of the work of others. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and being able to see how things work for yourself, I think, is just amazing. And and then the, that whole tool chain. So, in terms of, you've been able to figure out so much about so much. What are some of the things that, that that have stumped you the longest, or some things that kind of stick out as things that were really hard to crack? I mean, it feels like so much of what you've done is hard to crack. It may be hard to pick out an example. But you know, is there a favorite defect or, or artifact that took you a while to figure out? My my favorite quote on that goes to um, Matthew Garrett, who said he's he's not very good at computers. He's just really bad at knowing when to give up. <laughs> That's good. And I, I think for a lot of a lot of these projects, there's a surprising amount of yeah, just sort of banging against the same problem over and over, and saying, "What if I?" You know, send this bite? What if I send that bite? And occasionally I, I feel sort of like a, a, a human fuzzer for, for approaching these systems you know, where I'll just keep tweaking inputs or uh, parameters until things start to work. With some recency bias, my, my most recent you know, headbanging has been against uh, the Zigbee encryption protocols. And th- this is frustrating because They've documented them in a fairly massive uh, data sheet. But rather than saying, here's a little bit of Python or something to show you how it's done, it's written out in prose, like a 15th century alchemist uh, textbook. Oh, God. About, oh, God. Wow. You know, you know, you form the message by you know, concatenating these things, except for the leftmost bytes of this thing. And then you know, it, it's, it's completely impenetrable. And where is Zigbee used? Is, uh, isn't that IoT? Yeah, isn't it used for like like street lamps and things like that? Aren't they Zigbee connected? I mean, where is Zigbee? What's the use for Zigbee? Well, my personal use case is uh, that all of the IKEA smart devices use it. Ah. And I'm working on a project uh, to let people write their own firmware extensions for these, uh, these smart home devices. So similar to uh, my Magic Lantern project for the Canon cameras, the goal here is to let people write their own custom behaviors or add new sensors onto the the actual uh, light bulbs and LED drivers. That's awesome. Is this going to mean that we can make Jess's house less physically dependent on the internet? We've been working out of Jess's um, garage, and there have been moments where the, when the internet goes out, we are unable to adjust the heat. I definitely don't use the IKEA light bulbs. I use the the Philips ones. So that would need a different protocol. Different protocol, yeah. different incompatibility, I think I'm they, sure. I think the Hue Bridge is, is also Zigbee, but they've uh, I think Philips made a deliberate change to break compatibility a year or two ago. This is light bulb 
firmware incompatibility. Just to be clear, this is like they, the light bulbs are making themselves deliberately incompatible with one another? Yes. Yeah, Phillips went so far as to even disallow, well, you can do it so that you don't need the bridge and you just use pure Bluetooth to communicate with your light bulbs, which is also interesting. Oh, thank goodness. I know. So, <laughs> what, like, how many rings does my light bulb have? Right. Say, I mean, why? Like, is there a ring negative three on my light bulb? I mean, what, is there SMM on my light bulb? Trammell, one of the things that you talked about was your the Canon firmware reverse engineering. Could you describe how you got into that? That I mean, the guts it takes to load new firmware on your camera, on your SLR camera, is just more guts <laughs> than I've got. I mean, that was that that was very impressive. That was a a, a big decision. Um, and <laughs> the, that's actually a relief to know. Yeah. The, the first time I did it, I tried to boot my own firmware on it after you know, spending uh, a month or so reverse engineering and trying to make certain that I was doing, that everything was going to work. I yeah, sat down with my partner and said, well, here's what, <laughs> what I'm going to try. And I want you to say it, goodbye to the Canon camera, please. Okay, you yeah. Know. You know, wor worst case, uh, you know, maybe I can get it repaired under warranty. But it turns out that I was able to get new code running on it. And I found a really neat trick that doesn't modify the camera at all. That there is a developer mode or a debug mode that if you, if you have a specially named SD card with a specially named file on it, the camera will ignore what's in ROM and copy that file into RAM and jump into it. Whoa, oh, that that's, is scary. That's a good find. That's great, though. See, that's your, your first reaction to that is that's terrifying. My first reaction is that's great. I, mean, I guess it's great and terrifying. That's great. Yes. yes. So th this meant that it no longer was necessary to, to reflash the camera at all. Right. You just had to you know, rename the card, and suddenly we could run uh, firmware. And... That switched it from a incredibly terrifying uh, <laughs> sort of uh, you're going to break a three thousand dollar camera to hopefully this won't damage things and <laughs> yeah. to the best of my knowledge we've never bricked any of the any of the cameras that um, is amazing and how did you discover that mode how did you discover the debug mode from reverse engineering it yeah yeah from from walking through the uh, the boot path in the firmware to try to figure out sort of where do I need to hook things in order to be able to to get my code execution work in there? Wow. Um, and and it, was, it was one of those sort of, huh, that's funny. And it's a, it's an actual string on the SD card. The name of the SD card is how is what it keys on. Yeah, yeah. So if you, uh, and, and that was one of those things, you know, one of the points I've made in a few of the talks that debug strings are incredibly useful for the reverse engineer that, you know, so seeing something like, you know, a plain text string show up in there, you know, was one of those things like, huh, let me see what's happening there. Let me, let me walk through that code path. You know, what, what reference is that? So in terms of reverse engineering, it's always something. And, and I noticed that Rick Alther did this as well in his USB Anywhere exploit. I mean, one of the things that originally keyed him on it was the looking at, at a, an interesting string in a binary. It's like, wait a minute, what, what is that string doing there? How is it used? And right, how can I right. better understand it? Colin Molnar gave a, a fun talk at um, their HushCon or SummerCon where he pointed out that if you are a vendor and trying to keep tabs on the people reverse engineering your product, that you could embed some fairly unique but tantalizing strings in there and then buy Google AdWords for them. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that was a Usenix oh, talk or uh, something. Using security or yeah, using that is so dark and genius. I'm af I'm afraid to Google anything. I, I yeah. I'm gonna end. <laughs> because of course the first thing we do when you see these strings, you're like, oh, you oh know, I'm gonna Google it. Yeah, that is that is hilarious. And then I mean, you could buy an ad that would really give people a a start. Well, you don't even need to display the ad to them. It's just the did you suddenly get charged for it? Then you know, that means that someone has gotten you know to someone somewhere that stage yeah. in their in their firmware reverse engineering. Yeah, that's that's darkly genius and terrifying, uh, <laughs> and makes me afraid to Google arbitrary strings. But yeah, it's definitely one of those things where you know when you see something interesting like that, you know you kind of dig into it, like why is that there? So th there's one feature in the camera that I've not 
figured out that, or I've not found the pads for the debug UART, but I found that I did find the password for the debug UART uh, in the string. Yeah. It, so there's a debug UART somewhere. Now, is it possible that it's only on like a dev board? Is it possible that it's not on the camera as shipped? Sure. Yeah, it's it's really hard to know. You know, we we didn't. Canon doesn't uh, ship uh, schematics for for those anymore. Right. But going back to a previous point about that, once I ported it from the the Canon 5D Mark II, which is three thousand dollar camera, to the uh, T2i, which was a four hundred dollar camera suddenly the number of people willing to use it and try it out and develop for it just went from uh, literally one to <laughs> you know, dozens. Uh, and the a wonderful community developed around it and uh, some really motivated folks really wanted to keep developing it. So I handed the commit keys over to Alex and they've been running a you know, an absolutely amazing project uh, ever since. We just celebrated the uh, 10th anniversary of that project. That's great. And what does Canon feel about this? I mean, I'm sure they had very mixed feelings at the outset, but they've, they've got to, you got to embrace it at some point. They've never mentioned anything to me or anything publicly. So I, I personally know that it's sold a lot of cameras, but I don't know if they recognize that. There was a talk at uh, Black Hat and uh, Hack Lou from a group that found a vulnerability in, in the, uh, the P2P protocol on the cameras. And Canon did fix that. They actually issued CVEs and, and patched that. So somebody is paying attention. It, it seems that remotely exploitable ones, which this was, you know, are going to get fixed. Locally exploitable perhaps are not uh, a high priority. Interesting. All right, we got to take another quick break and then we'll be back with more Trammel Hudson and On the Metal. On the Metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company, where we're going to try a new feature shamelessly ripped off of Reply All's Yes, Yes, No, where our boss, Steve Tuck, brings us a tweet we, he does not understand, and Jess and I try to explain it to him. Steve, do you have a tweet? I sure do. Go the for it. The tweet in question, UEFI preboot network stack engaged the onboard NIC in such a way that it would write back DMA to particular physical memory pages sometime after control was passed to the bootloader. Corruption would occur somewhere in the user parts of the RAM disk. No idea. No idea. Jess, do you understand this tweet? So I understand definitely the part about the UEFI preboot networking stack, but the part about DMA is in question marks. So it's like, I guess you're not really sure where that's you're going. You're overthinking it. I understand this tweet. Running on-prem is painful. This is dealing with an awful, <laughs> awful firmware bug. The firmware has overwritten part of the operating system in a way that is extremely painful to debug. So who do you go to in that case? Who do you go to? You definitely strangle one of your vendors. You strangle one of your vendors. And unfortunately, your vendor is a PC vendor because all of the existing <laughs> computer companies are selling personal computers. What we need is a new computer company. So this is just saying I'm an in intense pain trying to run systems on premises. That's exactly what it's saying. Steve, what can someone do if they're in intense pain running on premises? Well, if someone is running in intense pain on premises, what they should do is go over to oxide.computer to learn a little bit more about how we are going to take that pain away. Help is on the way. Join us at oxide.computer. You are not alone. We're back with Trammel talking every kind of hardware software interface you can imagine. So Trammel, um, what have you been up to recently? You, met, you mentioned the, the Zigbee protocol. What's struck your fancy recently? So uh, like Jess mentioned, you know, it'd be really nice to have all of these home automation projects not dependent on the internet. So well, that's <laughs> something that I think is a, a really worthwhile goal. And along with my partner, we're, we're trying to put together some workshops and on how to build non-internet connected things. So it's not only Jess that has this problem then. I was giving Jess maybe too much grief, but it, a this is a common problem. A lot of them are, are poorly integrated. There is like, have you, have you looked at Home Assistant, Trimble, the open source uh, project? I've, we ran it for a little while. It, it's, uh, it's a bit of a beast to get up and running. Oh, no, it is. It is totally. I actually decided that I hated it after I did that. So, What is Home Assistant? It's an open source, kind of integrates or tries to integrate with every single kind of IoT device out there. 
But of course, it's a bear to configure. Uh, it's just a Python monolith. Right. Pretty large. So we've been playing around with a Node Red, which is sort of a fun box and string programming model for, for doing some of the home automation. Oh, nice. And it has plugins for Zigbee and HomeKit and a variety of other ones. The other one that I'm looking into playing with is the Mozilla IoT uh, gateway, that they have a fairly nice JSON object description where devices can can describe to the gateway how they want to be controlled. And that looks very flexible. That's cool. But the, the Zigbee ones are nice because they're so uh, very, very inexpensive. The IKEA ones are, are pretty high quality. They've got you know, nice um, Silicon Labs modules inside for doing the uh, all of the wireless. So I have enough reverse engineering done on there to be able to boot uh, MicroPython and either interface with the proprietary Ember stack that IKEA is using, although it, it, that turns out to be really space constrained. Only have a few tens of kilobytes to, to fit the MicroPython. Or what I'm working on now is, is trying to build a fairly complete Zigbee stack in Python that can then run you know, standalone in the MicroPython environment on there. Nice. Obviously, this is all neat and intellectually interesting. In terms of like, I, I have to confess, I'm a bit of a luddite on home automation. I'm still, I'm still with the light switches. Um, the nice thing is that you can actually like program at like, I can make it so that when I leave the house, certain lights turn on, or when I'm like entering the house, certain lights turn on. And or like, when someone's in the house, you can turn the lights off on them. Yeah, for sure. You, um, you you can you can set up almost like cron job like behavior for. On on an event, something happens. I just don't want to administer my house. I, maybe <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, again, I'll brick your house. I'll brick my house, exactly. So or if you're extremely wealthy, what you can do is is output this to like a remote sysadmin. So you have like this smart house and then this remote sysadmin has power over your entire house and all of your smart controls, which that sounds horrifying in and of itself. What hours do they work? I mean, I mean, it's more like, what are they going to do when they actually have like the power to control all your lights? Are they going to like just totally mess with you while you're watching some horror movie? I, I just like getting malware in my house just sounds horrifying. I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know. Tra- Tra- well, am I, 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 am I, am I, it sounds like you're much more optimistic about this stuff than, uh, than I am. Well, th- there's a few features that I really like. Uh, one of which is a, having a, uh, a big LED panel that slowly fades up starting about half hour before my alarm goes off. And it's able to then also adjust color temp during the day so that, you know, in, in the morning it's it's a much uh, more bluish light and then it's more yellow at night. Yeah, that That's handy. Being able to uh, turn various um, small localized heaters on so that we don't have to heat the entire house to uh, 22 or 23 degrees. We can, just augment, you know, in 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 my office or uh, in the bedroom. These are some nice some nice features. I also really like the ability to keep track of things like power usage, so that we can see how much how much are we using across the entire house, and you know, can we change behaviors to try to uh, reduce our our power consumption? Interesting. Yeah, be, being able to observe it. And you know, much like a magic lantern, you know, scratched one itch of mine that I needed, that I really wanted, um, you know, one feature on the camera. What got me started down this road is I wanted a a uh, dimmer dim for the LED panels. That the IKEA ones have uh, have eight brightness steps, and the dimmest one is still much much too bright for uh, for any sort of nightlight. So the first hack was uh, be able to swap out the PWM curve for one that actually goes uh, much, much dimmer. And success on that front? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's a, that was a very straightforward binary patch where there, there's no boot time security on the, uh, on the code. So I was able to you know, modify the, uh, the firmware in place. Uh, since then, I've reverse engineered the uh, the over the air firmware update protocol, so I no longer have to <laughs> open up the devices to to physically uh, reprogram them. Now, you must have incredible mixed feelings about that, because on the one hand, it must be a great relief to you that you are able to so easily interpose on your own things and run your own software on them. On the other hand, it's got to be somewhat horrifying that a a bad actor could do the same thing. And this goes back to. Uh, 
what uh, what Jess was talking about with the internet dependence of them, that most of the threats that I'm concerned about are uh, remote. You know, someone on close enough to join the uh, the Zigbee network and and do that. I probably have other problems to be worried about. So uh, you know, I think as long as we can keep these things off the internet, uh, I'm reasonably comfortable having sort of a lax uh, security posture on them. And basically relying on whatever physical security one has in one's home or the fact that it's going to be just not economically viable for me to try out 500,000 homes to find one that's vulnerable. But it, if you're internet connected, it's much easier for someone to actually do that work. As we saw with the Mirai uh, webcam vulnerability that you know, spread across the, I don't remember how many uh, millions of uh, vulnerable webcams, yeah, that, that's a much, much more significant concern than yeah. you know, someone war drive in to find a light bulb to, to hack. Interesting. So, so your thrust is like, hey, let's not even let's not spend our time on uh, preventing these things from being tampered with, but let's take them off the internet. Right, right, and they do have uh, a gate. IKEA does sell a gateway that does connect to the internet, uh, although it's very it's very thoughtfully designed that it connects to IKEA.ntp.org to get a, a, a update the time. And then it fetches a, a JSON file from IKEA.com of uh, all the firmware versions for the different devices. It will download those, and then it validates a uh, RSA signature on them before pushing them out to the devices. So if you don't give it uh, network access, it still works perfectly well. It, you just don't get firmware updates for your devices. Interesting. You know, compared to a lot of these other ones, that if you're not online, they just don't work at all. Yeah, and I can tell you when it's the heater and you're in a garage <laughs> and the pow- and the uh, the internet's out, it's uh, it can be uncomfortable. It can be a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, I think the the concerns with local attackers. Uh, you know, perhaps if somebody's wants to uh, prank someone, they they could do things. But again, these devices are not. Uh, they're not on on the Wi-Fi. They don't have connectivity to the internet proper. There's not a whole lot that capabilities that they really have. Interesting. So just limiting their surface area to keep them off the internet we, it is probably the single most important step, which a lot of these device manufacturers don't necessarily want to do. They, I mean, their whole business model is around getting you connected, right? And I, I don't fully understand why. You know what what the motivation is to have all of these things. Online, you know, are they really collecting that much valuable data about well, they, how often the lights are on? Well, that's what they're telling their investors. You know, you gotta, you gotta give the. You're using your AI on your data to uh, question mark, question mark, question mark. I don't, I don't necessarily know that they're they're doing that much with it, but they say they are. Yeah, and I think the there's a, there's a big push in you know, some of these communities to sort of re- regain digital sovereignty. And I think it, it's a good way to think about it. Um, you know, both for things like these automation devices, that they should be contained to networks that we can control, as well as to things like uh, we were talking about earlier with the servers, that we should be, uh, we should be controlling the firmware uh, that's running on there. We should control the root of trust. With our laptops, we should be able to change out the firmware, but we should be able to do it in a way that, that we can detect if someone else has has modified them. You know, I think the the digital sovereignty you know does span everything from from these smart home devices all the way to to, to our general purpose computers. But there are different trade offs that we need to make along the way. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting to kind of think of it as as sovereignty. I, and I think and you've got to describe the Intel boot guard issue you found. I think is too hilarious to not describe. Oh, it's so good. Uh, which one? <laughs> well, I guess the one I'm aware of, it sounds like there, there's more than one, but the one that you found where when you, um, I believe you you had a bad Dixie, and as a result, you could boot anything? Am I remembering that correctly? Okay, so that's um, that, that one is a fairly straightforward one. At least it's what I'm thinking of. That in that case, the, the, the way the UEFI firmware is organized in, in these sort of different firmware volumes... A lot of vendors will put all of the PEI, the pre-EFI ones on one firmware volume, all the Dixies on another one, 
And then a lot of times they'll put uh, sort of ancillary things like uh, boot logos or microcode updates in additional volumes. And a lot of times those volumes will not be signed. They will not be covered by BootGuard because uh, the OEMs might change out the logos. And also they want to be able to swap out the microcode without requiring that the whole firmware get, get re-signed. So that way if you, you know, when the next um, side channel attack comes out, you can, you can install that microcode without having to uh, get the OEM involved. Oh, I was going to say the next corporate rebranding changes the logo, but you're taking a much more uh, a much more elevated path. Well, both of those. Um, well, it turns out that the UEFI reference code would scan every firmware volume for executables and uh, would at least run the initialization code out of them, whether or not that firmware volume was covered by the uh, by the boot card signatures. So that particular attack was quite simple. That you know, add a new Dixie or a new PEI module to that firmware volume, it would get automatically detected and uh, run by the um, you know, by the by the CPU without ever getting measured or validated. That seems very problematic. So, very problematic, um, and because it was in the reference implementation, that affected pretty much every uh, OEM. Wow, and it shows the challenge of this that you you know you've got this whole mechanism that's designed to 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 measure things that you're booting so you don't boot the wrong thing, and effectively one bug or issue or nuance whatever you want to call this this kind of legacy uh, the capacity to evaluate these these things for for executable bits or executing the the initialization section resulted for the in the whole mechanism being circumventable. It turns out that a lot of these uh, chains of of trust fail kind of brutally in that way that if you get one if you can get one instruction executed that's not measured you can basically use that to uh, load arbitrary payloads and and do things which is one of the other boot guard vulnerabilities uh, that I found uh, along with uh, Peter Bosch from uh, University of Leiden which is that when after boot guard has validated all of the signatures it's supposed to do that entirely running out of cache so that way, uh, it never goes back to the to the flash chip. But there was a a bug in the way BootGuard switched from what's called caches RAM mode into normal DRAM mode. And when it did that, one instruction, or I think four instructions, would be loaded from the flash and executed. Oh boy! So th- this is this was the uh, my fir- my uh, second FPGA project watched the flash chip accesses for that second access and then would provide a different instruction. So this is a time of check, time of use vulnerability, you know, essentially a, a hardware race condition uh, that, that allowed a boot guard bypass. Via an FPGA. Wow, that's amazing. And also terrible. It's also, I mean, you, and just think that's a four instruction, just four instructions. I mean, it's so few instructions and yet it doesn't take, it doesn't take many unmeasured instructions to be able to circumvent the whole thing. You know, the first instruction you send is a jump somewhere else. <laughs> right. And, you know, th- then you're off to whatever location of code in the ROM that, that you want to run from. So given the challenge of this, are, are you optimistic that we can actually get a, a, a full chain of trust and, and be able to actually have uh, nice things in the server space? Can we actually have a, a hardware root of trust and, and get full firmware attestation? I think we can get a... I think we can actually start to get there, and I think we can start to apply uh, some higher-level language techniques to... Give us measurements of which code paths we've we've gone down, and you know, are basically do a, a, a tainting to ensure that everything that we that we execute has come from a measured path. The uh, the Uroot project that that uh, Linux Boot uh, depends on has re-implemented all of the firmware in Go, and it's really sort of amazing to think that we can we can th- throw uh, such a high level language at such a low level problem. And you know, Go gives a lot of uh, neat introspective capabilities that would be very difficult in in C. Yeah, interesting. Well, I've been, been playing around with with Rust on the Teensy, and the all the embedded Rust work has also been very interesting. It's it's fun to see these higher level languages be able to get into these small places. 
Yeah. And on, on the risk five side, there's a, um, a project called uh, Orboot. Yes. Which or, is, we uh, love Orboot. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like Coreboot, but in Rust. It's, it is Coreboot without the C, I believe. Hence Orboot. Yes. There you go. So many, uh, so many wonderful uh, metal based puns. <laughs> But Orboot is great. We, we, there was a great presentation on that at, at OSFC. Folks can check out online. So Trammel, I, I assume that the, the place to find you online is is tram.net, trm.net? Uh, that's certainly to keep up with a lot of the projects and uh, my talk schedule. I'm also on uh, QRS at mastodon.social or QRS on, on uh, the bird site. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, that's great. Trammel, thank you so much for joining us today on On the Metal. I, it, it's hard to imagine anyone who's done such more varied work at the hardware software interface um, and then documented it so thoroughly. So thank you on behalf of all of us for all of your contributions. They're, they're mesmerizingly good. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been wonderful chatting with you all. And uh, uh, I wish you the best of luck in your garage startup. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Well, provided the internet stays on so we can get the heat on. And the heat. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Trammel. And uh, thank you for, for joining us for On the Metal. You've been listening to On the Metal Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. For show notes, to learn more about our guests, or to sign up for our mailing list, visit us at onthemetal.fm. On the Metal is a production of Oxide Computer Company and is recorded in the Oxide Garage in Oakland, California. To learn more about Oxide, visit us at oxide.computer. On the Metal is hosted by me, Brian Cantrell, along with Jess Frizzell, and we are frequently joined by our boss, Steve Tuck. Our original and awesome theme music is by J.J. Wiesler at Pollen Music Group. You can learn more about J.J. and Pollen at pollenmusicgroup.com. We are edited and produced by Chris Hill and his crew at HumblePod. From Jess, from Steve, from me, and from all of us at Oxide Computer Company, thanks for listening to On the Metal.